here we go. Week nine, day one, big O. So big O is one of these core concepts in this class. And it's something you're going to revisit time and time again in your computer science career. You can't escape it. Big O is the um, uh, algorithmic ana analysis. The notion of like trying to figure out how long does a program take to run, okay, is a crucial, essential part of computer science. A lot of people think computer science is programming, but that's not exactly true. We obviously do do programming in computer science, but computer science is the science. It's a science. We study computers. We study algorithms. We study man-made uh, artifacts, which is fine in a science. It doesn't have to be all natural. You can study a computer and find out how long it takes to run something. And algorithmic analysis is sort of a, a mathematical tool we have to look at two different algorithms and be like, this one's probably going to be faster by a lot. Like, you know, this one's going to take the heat death of the universe and this one will take a fraction of a second. Let's do this one and not that one. Okay. And so uh, students typically are pretty weak on big O in this class. And so we're going to do an entire lecture on it today. So um, the big question that we want to ask is given n, and n is the size of the problem. So for example, if we wanted to add up <clears throat> 100 integers, then n is 100. If we want to add up 1,000 integers, then n is 1,000. If we want to add up a million integers, then n is a million. And our question is how does time change with size. And so for adding up integers, generally speaking, the amount of work we do, uh, the amount of work we do is kind of like equal to, you know, the number of numbers there are, right? In other words, the time is kind of equal to the n, or the way we put this is big O of n. And so we draw a line kind of like this, and we just say, for adding up numbers, then uh, it is O n. The amount of work we do is proportional to the size of the problem. And this is a very crude estimate. Um, a lot of people get really caught up in, oh, it should it be n plus 2 or n plus 5? We don't care. When n is a million, we don't care if it's a million or a million and one or 999,999. We don't, we don't care. We don't care. What we care about is the big picture with big O. And so this is this is a big picture uh, way of thinking about things, right? It's kind of like when the uh, U.S. government does uh, accounting, right? If uh, if your numbers add up within about a billion of where they should be, they're like, good, you got it, right? Federal Federal Reserve, you know, plus or minus a trillion, you know, there you go. Uh, we don't care about fiddly details like, oh, you know, expenses came in to three million and two cents you know, when your budget was 3 million, right? We don't care if it was 2,999,999 and 99 cents. We, we don't care, right? When you're, when you're on the level of like millions, like cents really don't matter. And um, probably even individual dollars don't matter. You probably care down to the nearest 10,000, maybe something like that. Like if you, you know, spend an extra grand on a, you know, extra day at a hotel or something like, yeah, nobody's going to care. So... <clears throat> Uh, what other kinds of options are there? Because this this is this is the pretty pretty much the easy to understand one. Uh, tablet disconnecting. There we go. Like this one makes sense. Like as you're given more numbers to add, you do more work. But there are some other options. There is, for example, order one, which looks like this, and that means constant running time. It does not mean one operation. For example, if you were to um, if you were to delete a node from a linked list and you had a pointer there, right? Let me sketch it out. You got the previous guy, you got the current guy, you got pointer pointing at him. By the way, there will be another linked list competence exam on uh, Friday, so make sure you study linked lists. We, we will be doing it in class again. So if we want to delete this person out, uh, there's a couple things that have to happen. Like if we just deleted him, now we've got pointers here that are dangling. They're pointing at deallocated memory. The list is broken. Everything's terrible. So if we want to delete this, we have to do a couple things. We have to 
set pointers previous is next to pointers next. Pointer points to previous points to next equals pointer points to next. And we have to set pointers next previous. Pointer points to next points to previous equal to my previous pointer points to previous. And then that will set this one here. And then we can delete pointer like that. And then size minus minus. So it's like four lines of code. But here's the thing. If you've, if you've already got a pointer pointing at that spot, does it matter how many nodes there are to the left and right? Like if we had like, uh, if we had like 100 this way, does it change how many operations we do here? If we had a billion, you know, next, 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 next. If we had a billion nodes to the right over there, would that change how many operations we do here? What do you guys think? Hmm. So the size of the linked list, which would be n, like if you have a hundred people in the linked list, a million people in the linked list, a billion nodes in the linked list, the amount of time it takes to delete something, when you've got a pointer pointing out that node, doesn't change. And so this is called constant running time. Okay. So this is order one, we call it. This does not mean, this does not mean one operation, right? Because we're doing like one, two, three, four. We're doing four things, but here's the thing. It's always four things. It's always four operations. No matter if we have a hundred, a billion, a trillion, it doesn't matter. It's always four. And so we call this order one. Boom. Okay. Constant running time. Uh, order n we call linear running time. And then there's more options as well. So let me switch onto the server. So let's take these lines one at a time. Betancourt, how many operations is this line of code here? Const int n equals 100. How many operations is this going to be? 100? It's gonna take 100 assembly instructions. We're gonna do, we're gonna set n 100 times. Order one. X equals 100. You know, we're just we're putting 100 into a variable. Now, funny thing, uh, this is actually probably gonna actually be order zero. Like, it's actually probably not gonna turn into any code at all. Um, but a lot of algorithms professors don't believe in order zero. Technically, mathematically speaking, order zero is distinct from order order one because you can give a tighter bound on performance. But they pretend it doesn't exist. But yeah, technically, um, <clears throat> probably, and I, I ran this through Godbolt in the previous class. If you do this, it's probably going to be deleted. You're, you're probably going to get what's called constant value propagation, 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 propagation. And what that means is that <clears throat> that variable is probably going to get deleted. Like it's probably not going to appear anywhere in the actual assembly code. And it's probably going to do something like this instead. It'll any, anywhere there's an n below, it'll put a hundred there instead. So order zero means there's literally no code. Like it literally doesn't run. Like how many, how many commands do you have to give to sort a sorted array? None, <laughs> right? Like it's no time at all. You know, and in fact, there's some things in the standard library that are always sorted. And so if you try calling sort on it, it fails. Like it will not allow you to call sort on a sorted thing. So uh, not avoid thinking like it's literally like we're talking like if you look at how many ins assembly instructions get generated by this, uh, none. But don't don't write this down. Don't write this. Down. This is um, not. This is a heterodox uh, opinion in uh, the C 
plus plus and algorithms community. Just call it order one and everyone will, will love you for it. Um, yeah, order one doesn't mean one. Yeah, I just said that. So, um, order, order one, uh, uh, it takes a finite number of steps. So it's order one. Well, it doesn't take any, it doesn't take any steps. Right. And so you can, you can have a tighter bound on the problem with order zero than order one, uh, as a result of that, because the way, the way that big O is defined is defined as K times the thing bounded and things like that. So, anyway, so, uh, so array in equals that. So, um, uh, Tipton, what does this mean? What does it mean to set an array equal to open, close, curly braces? And then uh, once we know that, we'll ask Aaron what the big O time of this line of code is. Hmm. What does it mean to initialize an array of size n, size 100, to open, close, curly boy? It sets the default parameters of the array. It sets, it does. It is, uh, Tefra, do you know? What it's going to be? What is this array going to be initialized to? And by the way, this doesn't work in C. In C, you have to write a for loop to do this. Zero. It sets everything in the array to zero. So what this does is clears the array. Okay. Big O running time, Aaron, is what? What is the, uh, I guess I don't need two question marks there. What is the big O running time of this? How many, how many operations is it going to take? to set a hundred elements to zero. Hmm. We have an array of size 100. We need to set all hundred elements to zero. How much time is this going to take? Order n, maybe. As a good first pass uh, approximation, probably order n is probably the array is the, is, you know, it makes sense, right? You have an array of size 100, and you're going to go through every element and set it to zero and set it to zero and set it to zero. So it should be order n. And you guys probably hear a but coming, right? Like, not that kind of but, my lord. Um, <laughs> uh, it's possible, it's possible that this is actually order one. Uh, but, uh, but that would be like an uh, there 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 are functions called like mimset and mimclear and b zero and calloc and things like that that are actually able to provide you zero filled data more quickly than just iterating across an array and setting everything to zero. So there's a possibility that when the optimizer runs on this, it'll actually do it in order one time. Um, but uh, order in. I think is a pretty good answer for for this question here. Okay, yeah, but there there's things like uh, calloc um, uh, returns zero filled data, uh, but that's off the heap. Um, there's like b zero and like mim set and mim clear, all these kinds of things that uh, sometimes can give you faster than order in performance because you know maybe your RAM has a special blinking function, right? Like if you like kind of turn it off and turn it back on again, it all turns into zeros. And so you might be able to blank an entire chunk of RAM and go bloop and it's zeros and then do it in one operation instead of a hundred or a million or whatever. Um, so uh, mim set and mim clear uh, can set a, any pointer, any, any array to, to zero or yeah, calloc is is off the heap. The other ones, you can give it a pointer and it'll clear uh, whatever's there. So, um, there's yeah, there there's tricks and things like that. Uh, whether or not it's worth knowing now, probably not. But it's you know, if you just want to think of it as order n, you're you're not going to be too far too far off base. Okay, now this thing here, uh, Megan, how many times is this for loop going to run? We say for anti equals zero, i is less than 100, i plus plus, print out, or we're printing out the array, right? How many times is this for loop going to run? What do you guys think? For anti, this is your standard pattern. There's no tricks here. Um, yes, that is correct. 
So if it's going to run n times, then we call it order n. The amount of times it runs is proportional to n. Okay, and I should probably put that into a comment. Okay. There we go. So 100 times or order n. Okay, cool. Let's make it a little more, more interesting. So for n i is j equals 0, j is less than n, j plus plus. So uh, we've got 100 elements in the array, and for each element in the array, we're going to go through every element of the array and add them together and print it out. So the first element is going to be added to the first element, then the first element is added to the second element, and the first element to the third element, and the first element to the fourth element. The third. And then after you've added up all 100 things and got to element 99, then you go to element 1 and you do 100 more. And you go to element 2 and do 100 more. And you go to element 3 and do 100 more. So this for loop here is also order n, right? So this for loop runs n times. This for loop runs n times. So the total any time of this loop is what? So how many times total are we going to see a value printed out? Let's make this small. Let's make this like. We got nine, right? Pipe through word count by line. We got nine lines of output. Okay. And if we did this with five, we get 25 lines of output. Okay. Does that make sense to you guys? So for every uh, for every one of these, it does 10 of these. And there's 10 of these. So 10 times 10 total running time is order in squared. Okay. If you want to be petty, we want to we can go down to instruction cycles, but we don't. When when we when we work with a uh, big O, like we re we really just don't care about like is this is this one operation? Is this three operations? Uh, anytime you do an array index, there is feasibly a multiply and an add in there. Uh, so this could be like two multiplies, three adds, two function calls. We don't care. It's constant running time. So this. This line, just that line by itself, is constant running time. And we don't actually care how many instructions it is until we're like in CSI 45 and like really trying to squeeze every ounce of performance. The thing is, big O matters far more than like almost anything else. Like if somebody gives you an order n algorithm and, and uh, somebody else gives you an order n squared algorithm, the n squared is going to be slower unless there's something horrifically wrong with the order n. The n squared algorithm is, is going to be, for any problem size worth mattering, it's going to be fantastically slower than the order n one. And so little tricks like, oh, you know, maybe maybe I can not do a multiply here. Maybe I could do a left shift instead of a multiply by two. Those things don't matter. Big O is so powerful and so important that if you have the wrong, uh, you know, order running time, if you're if you're if you're doing a sort that's order n squared, uh, most sorting is uh, most good sorting, I should say. They're order n log n, okay. and bad sorting algorithms like selection sort and bubble sort are n squared. Uh, that's why we use std sort std colon colon sort. We do that because it's order n log n. And we don't have to write it ourselves. Oftentimes, when we, when we write sort functions ourselves, it's order n squared, and that's way slower. So, like, let's just use a map. Um, if you're trying to sort uh, a million a million names in a phone book, let's say, good. We're in Fresno. There's roughly a million people. Um, if you use bubble sort, it'd be a billion times a billion, which is a trillion operations. And if you did this using quick sort or uh, merge sort or heap sort or one of the other n log n ones, the log base two of n of a million is about 20. And so you're talking about 20 million operations. So this is this is why big O is so important. 1,000 million billion 
trillion operations if you do a bad algorithm, and 20,000 million if you do a good algorithm, you're talking about a 50,000 times speed difference. And a million's not even that many people, right? There's like 8 billion people on the planet. Just for Fresno alone, your algorithm will run 50,000 times faster if you pick the right big O. This is why big O is so crucially important, why it's taught everywhere around the world uh, to everyone in computer science, because it makes such a huge difference. Like you might, you might be like, oh, look, I could probably, you know, save a, an operation here if I use dot add instead of square bracket or the other way around. It, like, no, like big O matters so much more. Okay. So, uh, a uh, radix sort is order n, yeah, but only works if you have uh, restricted data on it. Okay, so uh, the running time of this is n times n times 1. Do you guys see that? So whenever you have a for loop like this, the outer loop runs n times, and then for each of those, it runs the inner loop n times, and then for each of those, it runs this one time. And so if, if the outer loop is five, and the inner loop is five, five times it does five, so it's 25. Do you guys understand why this is like n squared? Like this is, does this make sense why this is an n squared algorithm? Okay. So what if we did iota array, array plus n one? So iota uh, initializes an array to, in this case, one, two, three, four, five, six, all the way up to, what do we have, nine. Yeah. Yep. So sometimes you don't want to initialize your things to zeros. You want to, you want to initialize it to like at one, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, nine, if you start with a one, zero, if you start with a zero. Uh, what do you think the big O running time of this is? Order yes, no. <laughs> How long do you think it takes to run? Uh, if you've got an array of size n, and you've got to set the first element to one, and the second element to two, and the third element to three. Order one, you can do that in, in one operation or constant operations. What if, what if the uh, what if the array total is a billion? Are is there some way of initializing the first element to one, the second element to two, and the third element to three in one operation? No, I don't think so. So, it is not order one. It is not order yes. It is order n. Okay. So iota is order n. And you could probably guess that, because like if you have a vector of size a million, it's got to go through all million elements and put one in the first one and two in the second one and three in the third one, you know, so on and so forth, right? So the compiler might do it at compile time, maybe. Maybe. But maybe not. So the CPP reference. IOTA will tell us the running time of this. And in fact, you can check the big O complexity of all these things by looking right here. No, that's not it. Uh, oh, last, okay, last minus first, okay. I thought it was like exactly last hyphen. No, uh, so it has to do uh, last minus first, so it's ordering. So last minus first, yeah. I would put parentheses around that myself. Okay, so it's ordering. All right. So now, what is the running time of our algorithm? Order what? So n times, it's going to do this n times, and then it's going to do order n work. It's going to do order n work n squared times. So it is n times n times n, also known as n cubed to the plebeians. So 
Um, cool. So usually the trick is just to look at for loops, right? You just kind of count how many for loops you have. Like, let me slap another for loop in here. Like this. And uh, let's call this out. Just like, I don't know. Array zero equals zero. That's about that. Okay. So what is the running time of this? If you have a triply nested for loop where each one's your standard pattern, i is less than zero, you know, i equals zero, i is less than n, i equals plus, j equals zero, j is less than n, j equals plus, they're nested together. If you have a triply nested for loop like this, what is the running time of this? Yeah, I commented out the iota. All right. Yeah, this is ordering cubed. And so that's that's kind of like how I would get through like algorithmic analysis. I just kind of look at the nesting of the for loops, right? If you have two, it's n squared. If you have three, it's n cubed. If you have four, it's n four, right? Now, the only time you can get a curveball is when it's like this, right? When the thing in the, when the meat in the middle of the sandwich is uh, more than one operation, right? This is doing n work every time the loop executes. What's the running time of this one now? And then we'll we'll go over log loops in a second. Doesn't work. Um, so what is the running time of this one? It's root n cubed times. We are doing n work, and so very good, Evolus. It is in fact order n to the fourth. Okay, not a fast algorithm. <laughs> that said, for small amounts, it doesn't matter, right? Like. Did you notice any pause at all there? No. Because 10 to the fourth power is 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000. We could do 10,000 things and that, you know, it's nothing. Even if we made it like, I don't know, 1,000, no, that actually might be. This actually probably will not happen immediately. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's slow. That's super slow. So a thousand becomes a million, becomes a billion, becomes a trillion. Yeah, it's like a trillion operations. So how big is n? There's no number for n. Like there's no how big is n. n is the size of the problem, right? So n is small, the time is small. When n is big, the time usually gets bigger if it's order n. But time doesn't change if n is big, right, uh, for order one. So there's other options here, and the other options are things like order n squared, also called quadratic time. Did my tablet turn off? It did turn off. Okay. And then you can have things even worse than that, like order n cubed, and then you can have way, way worse things, which are over here, like order 2 to the n, and then way, way, way worse things. That even go backwards in time, they're so bad. <laughs> no, sorry, I'm just running out of room on a graph. Order n factorial. Ooh, that's bad. Okay. So let's do let's do a little like let's do a little math here. Okay, so uh Otal, uh, do you understand like there is no like fixed size for n? Like we what we typically do is we plug in in our brains a couple different sizes. Let's try n equals 10. Let's try n equals a thousand. Let's try n equals a million. Let's try n equals a billion. And kind of see how the time reacts to it. Okay, so for like uh, ten, let's say, what's the difference between order two to the n and order n squared? These things look pretty similar, right? And they both have a two. They both have an n. And a lot of students don't have the intuition that this is bad and this one's like okay. It's not great. This isn't as fast as like order n. It's not as fast as order one, but it's okay. You can always throw more CPUs at an order n squared problem. This though is called intractable. In other words, it's unsolvable for any reasonable size. Okay. And so let's put, let's put a number in here. So what is two to the 10th power? Anyone know? And what is 10 squared? To the 10th power is 1024, 10 squared is 100. Doesn't seem too bad different. It's like if 
10 times 10 difference. Not that bad, right? Not that bad. What about uh, 20? What is 20 squared and what is 2 to the 20? It's a million. 400. What is 2 to the 30th? A billion ish. And 900. What is 64 squared? 4096, right? Uh, and then 2 to the 64th power is like 15, like, times 10 to the 15th, I think, something like that. I don't even know. It's a big number. It's a really big number. Like, it's a huge number. Like, there's a pretty big difference between 4,000 and, like, you know, when you have to, like, count how many zeros are on there. Like, <laughs> it's called NP time. Two, let's see. Let's see let's sample the mode. So 2 to the 64th power, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Sorry, it's 18 uh, times 10 to the 18th. There you go. It's a really large number. Have you guys ever heard the uh, story of the, the advisor to the king? Uh, this is like, and, and even scientific notations, like, well, it's not that bad, right? There's a big difference between like 4,000 and like a number that's so high, it's like beyond trillions and quadrillions. And you don't even know what the next thing is, like pen pentillions. You know, like there's a world of difference between these two things. And that's with 64. Like if you're if you're sorting like 64 names, like that's not a lot of names to be sorting. You know what I mean? And uh, order in squared is already like kind of bad. Like we could do it in order in log n time, right? So if we did it with like order uh, in log n time, which is your normal quick sort or merge sort or something like that. Uh, the log base 2 of 64, anyone know it? 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, it's 6. So it'd be 6 times 64, or 360 plus 24, which is 384 steps, roughly. So with quick sort, you'd be doing 384 steps. With selection sort or bubble sort, you'd be doing 4,000. And if you did uh, something like this, which would be like a bogus sort or something like that, how does that work? You try every permutation of the numbers and Pick the one that's sorted. So you're you're given a bunch of cards. You 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 switch them randomly until, uh, but systematically until you find out that they're sorted. So you, you can think of it as kind of like shuffle. Is it sorted? Nope. Shuffled again. Is it sorted? Nope. Try a different shuffle. Is it sorted? Nope. Try a different shuffle. Is it sorted? Nope. It takes a while. It takes a lot longer than 384 steps. This is good, okay? This is, yeah, it's workable. It's not the worst thing in the world. And this is the heat death of the universe, right? And so exponential complexity is for any any reasonable size, like 100 or 200, the, the number explodes so badly that um, it's basically unsolvable for any, for any particular size, okay? So, you guys understand? You ever seen Order Two to the End? Order Two to the End is like really, really garbage. The only, the only thing worse than that is like a Order N factorial, which is kind of what I was talking about there. So Order N factorial, which is like try all permutations, you know, try all possible combinations of these numbers and find the one that works. You know, uh, this is really, really garbage. Uh, so for 64 things, uh, it's going to be like, it's going to be like 10 to the 84th power, I think. That's really bad. <laughs> it's, and that's for 64. <laughs> it's like 64 factorial, something like that. Uh, 64 screaming, uh, 89. Sorry, I underestimated it by a factor of 10,000. Sorry about that. All right. 10 to the 89th power, something like that, okay? Uh, so that would take a while. Well, if you're only sorting two cards, it works fine. Try all part permutations. One and the two, the two and the one. Pick the one that's sorted. You're done. For three, one, two, three, one, three, two, two, one, three, two, three, one, three, one, two, three, two, one. There you go. It's sorted, greatest to smallest. You're done, you know? It'll even work for very small, very small numbers. So that's why with Big O, we care about like the big picture. Like how do, how do these numbers grow as the problem size gets bigger? Okay. 
So let's uh, let's give an example using linked lists because you're going to have another linked list. Um, Confidence exam in class on Friday. So we got our typical doubly linked list here, and this kind of stretches off into the into the distance. Maybe this whole thing is one billion nodes long. So n is equal to one billion, right? So that's that's your problem size. Whenever you work with data structures, typically um, n is how many elements are held in the data structure. If you have a vector of size a billion, then n is a billion. If you have a linked list holding a billion numbers, it's a billion, okay? So how long, what is the big O? What is the big O? You, you got head way over here somewhere. You got tail way over here somewhere, right? This is head, this is tail. What is the big O, everybody, to print all of the elements in the linked list? What do you think, Rohan? What is a digital fortress? Good, yes, it is order in. Basically, you just start at the beginning, you print the value, go to the next one, 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 print the value, and then a billion operations later, you, you got your list printed. Okay, that is definitely an order in print. Okay, now here's a question. You got one list, and then you got another list. You got head two, I don't know, over here, and he's pointing at, and you got a billion of these guys. And let's go dot, dot, dot. And we got tail two, okay? So if we wanted to attach a billion people from list two, here's list one. That looks like a U. Here is list number one and list number two. If we wanted to attach them to each other, so they would print all of these guys, followed by all of these guys. How many operations does it take to merge two linked lists like that? Order M, M for merge, I see, Aaron. Uh, <laughs> so we've got a billion on the first guy, and let's say M is equal to a million on the second guy. So N is the size of the first list, M, is the size of the second list, and I pick a million for M because it's M, I don't know. And I pick a billion for N because I don't know. Order N squared. So for every element here, you have to do something on this one. And then for this guy, you have to do something on this, all of these. And for this one, you have to do something on all these. And on this one, you have to do something. No, I don't think so. It is definitely not order N squared. <clears throat> oh, Dan Brown, okay. It's just holding numbers. They're not sorted. Okay. Order n1 plus n2. So you're saying you have to go through every element of the linked list, and then every element of this linked list, and add them all together or something. We're not we're not adding the numbers. We're merging the lists. So we're going to merge the lists together. So the two lists are now one list. They are not held in any order whatsoever. Brandon, what do you think? We got to vote for order N from Bencourt. We got to vote for order exponential one for Aaron, which I'm not sure what that means. Uh, order O merge. I don't know what that means. Order merge. There's no order merge. What is it? If you've got a big linked list, and you want to connect the two of them together. What do you think? Very good, Brandon. Yes, it is order one. Okay. It is an order one operation. So you got all these people in list one. What you do is you get the next from tail. And right now it's pointing at null, right? And what you're going to do is you're just going to set tails next to be head two over here. You set head two's previous to be this guy over here. And you're done. That's it. Two operations. Three if you update the size, right? That's it. You can glue them together now. 
Uh, you got to update the old, the, the, the tail's got to be tail two over here. You know, it's like tail's got to update to here, I guess. So it's four operations, whatever. It's constant. It's constant running time. It does not matter how big the linked lists are. All it needs is a couple, a couple lines of code to connect the uh, pointers together and uh, move the tail and update the size. And in just basically one step, you've got uh, two lists that are now connected together. Does that make sense? You do not have to loop over, like, why does this guy care? You know, like, why, what are you going to do with that guy? You don't, you don't care. You've got a tail pointer there for a reason. Like, if you didn't have a tail pointer, then yeah, it'd be order in, because you'd have to, like, go through the whole thing to find the tail. That's why we keep a tail, so you do things like this quickly. If it was sorted, it would matter. Yeah, then you'd have to go through and, like, merge them together and things like that. Um, but uh, we are not sorting. We're just clicking them together. Boom. That's it. So that's actually one property that lists have that's really nice. Benefit to lists. Lists win. They're the only data structure uh, out of the data structures you're going to study in this class, at least, that you can merge them quickly. They're order one merge, right? If you if you do it this way. So if you have a billion people in one list and a billion people in another list, you merge them by just going like this with the pointers, and you're done. Now they're connected. It's like if you had a million long Legos and a million long Legos, you could just go like this, click, and now you've got two million Legos in, in a row, and you don't have to like take all the Legos apart, you know. No, you just, the very end, click them together. That's it. The Lego metaphor. All right. You like the Lego analogy? Me too. I just made it up. So, um, <laughs> I'm sure somebody's made it before though. But yeah. You don't have to mess with the whole, the whole Lego block. You can just click the ends together and then they're all connected. So yeah, merging is actually something that the linked lists are good at. Um, it's something that they can do that vectors can't do, right? Like Im imagine like you have a vector, right? If you've got, Six guys here, and you got uh, was it? six, seven guys here. Uh, if you want to combine these two, like you just have to copy all the elements out, right? You guys see that? Like you just this is n m six seven. So if you want to merge these two things together, then you'd have to go like push back m times, right? You guys see that? Like you'd have to add seven, you'd have to add eight, you'd have to add nine, add 10, add 11, add 12. So this would be an order M algorithm to glue them together. You guys understand? So vectors would suck at merging. Order, order N is not bad, by the way. Like it's not bad. It's not terrible. Uh, by any stretch of imagination. It's not horrible. But order one's faster. Okay, let's take a look at the code again. It's like, okay, yeah. Like, if you if you have an order one option, then uh, I would encourage you to do the order one option instead of the order in option. Uh, anytime you can move up a complexity class, anytime you can uh, go from, like, here to here or from here to here or something like that, you want to do it. Like that makes a bigger difference than like anything else when it comes to optimizing, right? If you can go from order n cubed to order n squared, do it. You know, if you can go from order n squared to order n, do it. Like it, it that will just boost your performance like through the roof. And the only time you don't care is like when you're down here. Like if, if n equals like two, like nobody cares, right? Nobody cares. If n equals five, nobody cares. You know, you, you could feasibly have a permu like permutation code for like all five permutations of a number and like nobody would care, right? Unless you're like doing some sort of, sort of like high frequency trading or something. Um, like for really small ends, like it, it just doesn't matter. We've got computers that are pretty fast. So, all right, let's try this.
Okay, so Caleb, what is the running time of just this line here? Not the total loop, not the total loop, uh, but just this line here to add two numbers together. Is that order one, order n? What is it? You're going to just add two numbers together. What is that? Everybody, what is it? It's order what? Good. Order one. And so the total running time of this loop right now is what? N times. We're doing one work. So this is order N. Good. Uh, in practice, if you have the optimizer on, this will be order zero. The optimizer will look at this code and say there is no, um, you're not doing anything with it, right? You're doing all of this work and the output is in sum and you're not doing anything with sum. The optimizer will actually delete all of this code. So <laughs> you're not see outing anything. You're not doing anything with the sum. This is actually completely dead, dead code, right? So this is actually, um, yeah, don't say order a thousand because that that sounds like it's, con you know, it's it's proportional to n. The amount of work you do is proportional to n. Okay, and so what's funny though is that this this probably will get deleted through like uh, like dead code removal, right? So like none of this does anything, and so the optimizer will probably delete the entire thing. Um, or if you did this, see how it's sum. Then what is this gonna print? Comments are deleted. They're not, they're not, they don't run. Comments don't take up any space in the executable at all. So uh, in this case, though, we're doing something with the value, right? So we're adding up all the numbers from 0 to 99. Or if we wanted, we could go from 1 to 100. Okay. So we're going to add up all the numbers from 1 to 100. The optimizer, if you have the optimizer on, will actually pre-compute this value for you. And then just put the value here. And so you won't see any assembly code for this. The loop will be deleted entirely. And so the optimizer will take this from order n to order one, which is nice. Anytime you can drop an order of magnitude like that, you want to take it. And the optimizer will actually do it for you. So what is this going to print? Anyone? Add up the values from one to 100, you get 50-50 or something. No, wait, zero. Did I compile it? Uh, Uh, it's because I didn't do IOTA, right? Okay, so IOTA, I deleted my IOTA code. So array, array plus n, and one. Right. Uh, thank you very much, compiler. You're my friend. There we go, 50-50. Right, sum of all numbers from uh, one to one hundred is fifty fifty. Right, you guys all knew that, right? Gauss, Carl Gauss, Carl Friedrich Gauss. When he was in fifth grade, his uh, uh, elementary school teacher gave the came in with like a hangover, like didn't want to teach, just wanted to put his head down, just rest. We've all been there, and so he gave his students some busy work. He said, "All right, add the numbers from one to one hundred up." And like 10 seconds later, Gauss comes up. He's like, here you go. The answer is 50-50. And the teacher didn't believe him and had to sit there and with a hangover, like add up all the numbers. He's like, wow, how did you do it so fast? And uh, the answer is the average number between 1 and 100 is 50.5, right? So uh, the average number is 50.5. And there's 100 numbers. So 50.5 times 100 is 505 times 10, 50-50. Boom. So... You can impress your friends at parties now.
uh, yeah, if you uh, you average the uh, top and the bottom number together and multiply by the number of elements, and there you go. Or you can add them together and multiply by half the number of elements. Either way, there's a divided by two in there somewhere. So amaze your friends, impress your friends, win a bet at a party. But the optimizer can actually compute that. So the optimizer will look at this code and actually not run the loop and just put 50-50 in there and the result. But you don't need to worry about that for now. What we do need to worry about is a curveball that I'm about to throw in here. Friends, computer science major. <laughs> yeah, no, I, there, there are some computer science people that are social. That's true. So, um, how many times is this loop going to run? Just that line. Don't worry about the line above it. Don't worry about the line below it. How many times is this for loop going to run? And over two times? Nope. One time? Nope. Login time? Yep. That is exactly right. So uh, what we have here is uh, is a third num third kind of thing. A new a new challenger has entered the arena. So uh, let's say that n was sixteen, right? The first time through the loop, n is sixteen. Is sixteen greater than zero? Yes. We do the thing, and then 16 is divided by equal to 2, so it becomes 8. So the first time through the loop, uh, j is equal to 16. We divide equal it by 2. Next time through the loop, it's 8, and then it becomes 4, becomes 2, then it becomes 1. 1 divided by 2 is 0, and n is your math. And so we have a total of 5 iterations. This is a log base 2 of n algorithm. Or that line, I should say, is order log base 2 of n. Now, logarithms are something that most students are terrified of. Uh, and as it turns out, the base doesn't matter either. Like, you can omit the, the base 2, and most computer science people do that, because the base actually doesn't matter. Remember, we're talking about Federal Reserve math. Trillion here, a trillion there, soon you're talking about real money. So, for every doubling of work, like if I changed n from 16 to be 32, for every time you double the amount of work, you do one additional iteration. That's wild. That's really good, actually. So if you if you uh, were to go from 32 elements to 64 elements, you would only go from six iterations to seven iterations. This is really good. Now, a lot of students have completely forgotten what a logarithm is. And a logarithm is the opposite, a log, is the opposite of exponentiation. So remember how we said that exponentiation was bad, right? Like, bad, right? Like, it becomes, like, intractable. Like, order 2 to the n is so bad that for any size, like, 100 or whatever, like, which isn't even that many cities or whatever, the process, it is unsolvable. Okay, so a logarithm is the opposite of exponentiation. And so for, instead of it getting twice as bad every time you add an element, instead of that, for every doubling of the elements, you do one more work. It's really good. And so the rule here is the log base 2 of 2 to the n is equal to n. So exponent and log cancel out. It is the opposite of exponentiation. And most students don't remember it because... Um, like when I was in eighth grade and taking algebra, I asked the teacher, I was like, hey, when are we going to use logarithms? And she said, well, you know, there are these things called slide rules. And if you want to use a slide rule to do calculations, you have to understand logarithms. And I'm like, lady, it's the 90s. Like, we have calculators. We've had calculators for 20 years now. Like, I don't need to use a slide rule. Um, 
don't know if you guys know, even know what a slide rule is. One of these things. You might have seen them in like old 50s and 60s thing. A slip stick. Yeah, there it is, slip stick. Uh, yeah, so you move these things around, you can use them to do calculations. And I was like, no, I'll just stick to my calculator, thank you. And it is based on the logarithm. Boom, there it is. Uh, don't care. And so I was like, okay, so what you're telling me is that I don't need to know this. Okay, cool. And then I got to computer science. I'm like, oh, logarithms are everywhere. Oh, damn. I should have paid more attention in eighth grade, you know what I mean? So, uh, yeah, logarithms come up a lot in computer science. A lot in computer science. And so where do they, what do they look like? What is the running time? The running time of logarithm of n looks kind of like this. Let me fill in the gap there, okay? Order log n, I should say. And this is logarithmic running time. So if you have n equals a million, the log base two of a million is 20. So if you have a million things, you can solve the thing in 20 steps. It's pretty good. And if you go from a million to 2 million things, you doubled the size of the problem. The number of steps it takes you to solve it goes from 20 to 21. That's really good. Like it's not, it's not as good as constant running time, but it's pretty good. Like login is like pretty, pretty fast. And it, it's fast enough usually for most cases. So anytime you get an algorithm down to like order login, like that's pretty good. That's a, that's a fast algorithm. Okay. So, um, so for example, uh, a, an example of like a log logarithmic algorithm would be if you have a sorted array, like a phone book, right? And so you can have Aaron, you can have Bedencourt, and you can have Cameron, you can have Ella. And you can have uh, Megan, you have Rohan, and we're running out of students. Uh, Stan, and uh, Velma, and Wilhelm, and Zebra. Okay. So, when you guys read through a phone book, do you, and you're looking for somebody's name, do you guys know what a phone book is? I hope you do. Okay, so uh, when you when you go through a phone book, uh, do you start at like AAA towing and just like read one letter at a time, and like, huh, eh, I'll I'll get to I'll get to Voss at some point, you know? Uh, as a kid, yes, yeah. Did you ever find? Did you ever make it all the way through? No, nah, probably not. It's ridiculous. Yeah, that that would be an order in search, right? You know, start at AAA towing, and then like go down. Right, that's order in. We can do better. We can do this in order log in using phone book search. So you start in the middle, right? Like cut in half, see where I'm at. Exactly. So you flip the book open, right? We're looking for uh we're looking for Cameron. Okay. So you flip the book open to the middle, and we're like, all right, is C to the left or C to the right? Uh to the left. Okay, cool. And so what we do is we essentially throw away that whole half of the phone book, right? Metaphorically. I mean, you could rip it out if you want to throw it away. And then we repeat, okay, of the remaining phone book, cut it in half. And is camera to the left or right? It's to the left, okay. This half the phone book, it's thrown away. Repeat, we're here, okay, camera's to the right. We throw the left half away and we found Cameron, okay? And so we can find Cameron in log base to of whatever we had there. What do we have? Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah, so like three or four steps. We could find any any name in the phone book and log base to uh, time, maybe round it up in case it's not an even power two or something, right? You guys understand? And so if we were to add, if we were to double the number of names, right? If we add an equal number of names here. Uh, that are all after zebra somehow, then our first step would be like, all right, is it in phone book one, phone book two? It's in phone book one. All right, cool. Bye. And even though we doubled the size of our phone book, it only takes one more step. Okay. And some easy 
things to remember is order uh, log n or log base 2 of n is fast. Okay, that is a fast algorithm. And, and most people don't grasp that because they don't really understand logarithms. So just understand that a log n algorithm, you know, again, you don't need the two. A, a log algorithm is fast. That is a fast algorithm because for every doubling of the work, you only do one more step. That's really, really good. It's as fast as exponentiation is slow. So uh, just to give you some ideas here, uh, the log base 2 of 1,000 is roughly 10. The log base 2 of a million is roughly 20. The log base 2 of a billion is roughly 30. So if you wanted to find, if you had a phone book that had every person in the planet on it, all 8 billion people, a phone book that has 8 billion people in it, how many steps would it take to find the location, the entry for 8 billion people in the phone book? What do you guys think? 240 is wrong. Two hundred forty-one million steps is wrong. Thirty-one is close. So if it's thirty steps to do a billion, then thirty-one steps would do two billion. Yeah, it's about thirty-three steps, right? So thirty steps is a billion. So two billion is thirty-one. Four billion is thirty-two. Eight billion is thirty-three. So the log base two of eight billion is about thirty-three. And I'm I'm rounding slightly, but just as a good rule of thumb. This is actually a great way of doing the mental math. Okay, so the log base two of eight billion is about thirty-three. So three, thirty-three steps. Your computer runs at like five gigahertz or something, right? You, you do. You're doing five billion operations per second per core, and you've got like maybe twenty cores in your computer. So you're doing a hundred, you know, billion operations a second on your CPU, and it takes thirty-three to find any person on the planet in the phone book. That's pretty good. That's pretty good, okay? So how, how long would it take to sort 8 billion names, okay? So if you have 8 billion people, how long does it take to sort? Well, what kind of sorting algorithm are we using? Are we using bogus sort? No. Uh, there is no order in sort. Okay. There's uh, there's bad sorts. Uh, this is like selection sort and bubble sort. And these guys are order in squared. So for them, Stall and sort, yeah, you just delete anybody who's not sorted. It's order in. <laughs> so uh, for selection sort or bubble sort, it's going to take n squared. So what is 8 billion squared? It's a lot. Uh, let's see here. Thousands, millions, billions, trillions, quadrillions, 64, pentillion. I don't know. I don't even know what the number is. 64... Pentillion? Is that even a word? I don't know. Like, when you're at the level where you don't even know what the the place numbers are anymore, that's bad. Okay? So, yeah, it's like I overflowed. I integer overflowed, right? Uh, but what about if you have a good sort? Um, so that would be like merge, merge sort, uh, heap sort, quick sort. Um, these are order n log n. So how many operations would that be to sort 8 billion people? Do you remember what the log base 2 of n is? 33, yeah. So it is 33 times what? 
the login is 33. The in here is 8 billion. So what's the answer? How many operations? 264. Solid. 264 billion operations, roughly. Now, remember, each one of those things could actually be four or five steps, but we're just sort of doing a big picture thing here. Roughly 264 billion operations. Okay, so if, you're, if your CPU is capable of a billion operations a second, it would take 264 seconds, which is four minutes to sort every person on the planet and put them in order. It's not bad. Like, it's not bad. It's not. Like, how often are you going to sort every person on the planet? Probably once, right? <laughs> you know, if you're, if you're putting together the phone book, like the official phone book for planet Earth, you're going to sort it once, you know, maybe a year, right? Like, next year, I'll sort it again. It'll take me four minutes next year. Okay. Not a big deal. So once a year, you spend four minutes, you sort every person's name, and then, you know, if you wanted, you could buy, like, some supercomputer to do it for you faster. But why? You know, if you're running a program once a year to make the phone book, who cares if it takes four minutes? Honestly, it's fine. Uh, this one, though, uh, huh, huh, uh, how, long would, how long would that take to run? Uh, what, what do we have here? Eight million billion times equals, okay, <sighs> divided by one billion operations per second. So this is the number of seconds, that many minutes, that many hours, that many days, that many years, 2,000 years. So this is like 2,000 years. And this one's four minutes. You guys see why big O is important? It doesn't look like much. N versus log N doesn't seem like much. There's N times N and N times log N doesn't seem like there's a big difference. Like I said, most people don't have a concept of like log N and what that means. As it turns out, you have two two thousand years or four minutes as your as your as your options there. So which one do you pick? You know, so. <laughs> Yeah, by the time it's sorted, like, yeah, there's probably been some population changes on the planet. Like, what did we have two 2,000 years ago? Like, in the Viking Age, I don't know, was like 30 million people on the planet or something? I don't know. Uh, yeah, there's been some demographic shifts since uh, Roman times, right? Yeah, like, 2,000 years ago, you had the Roman Empire and China and, like, I don't know. How many people were alive back then? Millions, okay. Uh, okay, 170 to 400 million. Right. Yeah, there's some people back then, but we've had some growth since then. You guys see the difference? This is why big O is so important. All right. And like, I mean, I had an algorithm that like, I knew I could actually make it faster. Like I, I had a program that took 15 minutes to run. It took 15 minutes to run and I knew I could make it twice as fast. Because what it was doing is it was rerunning its calculation every time. And I could just like save it and then just like reuse the save calculation instead of rerunning it every time. And um, I didn't because I ran it once a year. And so I didn't care. It would have taken me, I don't know, a day or so to rewrite it. Probably less, probably three or four hours. But I didn't care because once a year I'd go and I'd do this. Boop, I hit a button, I drive to Starbucks, get a coffee, come back, all the computations for the year are done. I had, like, that was good enough. It was good enough. It was. I could just not care about it, you know? And uh, that, that one button that I hit there paid me $30,000. So, how many projects did I have going on that did that? About eight. So, I'd make about 240000 a year by going, boop. Going to Starbucks and coming back and getting some data. Then I mean, I would type up some things. You know, I'd write some some essays. I'd look at the data, I'd do the analysis. But like the actual numerical number crunching was done by a program I wrote, 
And uh, that's one of the reasons why I was very popular with people is because all of my competitors were doing this by hand. They were grading tests by hand. And so they would have like four questions, you know, to assess a student's American history knowledge. You'd give them four questions. I'd give them 30 and it'd all be digital. It'd all feed into a database. And then at the end of the year, I'd hit a button boop, like that. And it would score everybody's test from every school. It would aggregate them at the um, classroom level, at the school level, at the district level, at the county office level, at the state level, and on the national level and run stats across all of them, comparing control group, experimental group at all these different levels. Uh, fifth grade, eighth grade, 11th grade, uh, broken down by gender and race and uh, just all these are numerical analysis things. And I just go like this, boop, and I'd leave, I'd get a coffee, I'd come back. There's all my numbers. And then I'd spend, you know, eight hours or so probably writing a report and talking to the district and like working on it and saying, okay, well, we were successful at fifth grade, not, but at eighth grade, uh, we didn't see any improvement in boys between the control and the experimental groups. So let's work on that next year. Like there was, you know, some actual work that I did, but, um, the, uh, the upshot was I got paid a lot of money because I knew how to program computers and my competitors, my competitors didn't. They would do everything by hand. They would have very poor analysis because they just couldn't like, there's no physical way they could compare with a computer running nonstop for 15 minutes. You know what I mean? Like that's a lot of calculations and they were doing it all by hand. So, um, yeah, I mean, just off that, but in court, I, I, I had other stuff going on too. So, um, uh, that was just, that was just the, uh, uh, the education research. I also did professional development and some other stuff as well. So, uh, yeah. So when you understand big O, then like you can make decisions like that. Like sometimes four minutes is fine. But, like maybe let's say that you're trying to like sort every person on the planet every minute, you know, like maybe as kids are born, you need to add them. You need to add them in. Well, as it turns out, bubble sort here, bubble sort here, this guy. is actually really fast if the array is almost sorted. If you're just adding one new kid, new baby to the uh, to the already sorted, you know, array of people on the planet, bubble sort runs if it's almost sorted. So in other words, if everything's sorted except one element, then bubble sort and sort it in and order in time. And so basically what it does, it just slides through the array until it finds the spot it's supposed to go and then puts it there. So it swaps things down the line until it finds the right spot and stops, you're done, order in. So that would be a uh, worst case, right? Uh, so remember, big O is always worst case, right? So worst case is the new kid you're adding is at the very beginning or at the very end? What do you guys think? So, uh, you know, you're, you're adding a new kid and it's sorted A through Z and you're up with uh, the A's. What is the worst case for that kid to be? Give, give me a name for a kid that would be at the very end of the line, so to speak. Zebra, zebra, exactly. And so zebra, zebra would have to go through and it would swap all, zebra, zebra all the way down to the very end. You're like, ah, oh, dang it, last place. That's the worst. The worst case scenario is big O. We don't care about getting lucky, right? Oh, his name was Triple A Towing. Done. Order one. No. We don't care about best case. We care about worst case. And so what is the worst possible name? Xyla. Perfect. Then what you do is you put Xyla in and it goes to the end and then it's sorted. And it's order end. So that's 8 billion operations. So that's 8 seconds. It's not bad. So the first time, the first time you put your phone book together of eight billion people it takes you four minutes. Then after that, every time a kid's born, it takes you eight seconds to add them to the thing. Uh, unfortunately, I think kids are born faster than one every eight seconds, but you know that's why maybe you buy like a, you know two or three. You, you get two or three cores running on it, you know, instead of instead of one, right? You, you spring for the dual core. Uh, <laughs> It's like this is the year 2006 or something like that. 
Yeah, so on any on any modern system with multiple cores, if you could parallelize the operation, then um, basically you can keep up to date as new babies are born. You can sort them in, good to go. Uh, yeah, if you were using a yeah, if you're using a binary tree, and we're coming to that, uh, binary trees are going to be even faster. Yeah, well, that's our topic for Wednesday. So make sure you guys work on EU4. Uh, try and have uh, any questions handled like tonight, ideally. We're going to start a brand new topic on Wednesday called Binary Trees. And um, uh, there's a lot of logarithms in that. So maybe I'll do one more, one more uh, thing up here. What is the running time of... What is the running time of this for loop here? What's the running time of that loop? Not a trick question. It should be pretty easy for you. What do you think? Standard loop analysis, right? You look at the for loops. When I was at a CPPCon 2017, I was taking an Uber from CPPCon, and on my Uber popped up, hey, would you like to take a programming question quiz? And I'm like, what? Like Uber, like my DriveShare app was like, would you like to take a programming quiz? And I'm like, okay. I hit yes. And it gave me big O analysis. It's like, here, here's, uh, and it's in Python. And I was like, uh, great, I'm not really, I don't really do Python much. But I got the questions right, because what I did was I looked at the loops. It's like, what is the big O running time of this? And I'm counting the loops. I'm like, okay, that's a order in, that's an order log in, that's an order in, you know. Very good, very good. This is order in. So what is the total running time of this loop? And so I got, I think I got like two out of the three right uh, on it, because I think one of the questions, like the function call itself was like order in log in or something, but um they're like, would you like to apply for a job at Uber? And I'm like, no, thank you though. But kind of a cool job, uh, job hunting thing. It just randomly would pop up for people, I guess, at CPPCon. Like, you know, they know you're a nerd if you're going to the international C++ conference. So what is, uh, uh <laughs> so what is the running time of this total algorithm? What do you think? We got an order in on the outside. We got an order login on the inside. Another login on the inside. What's going on here? What is the total running time of this algorithm? So the outer loop runs in times. Then for each one of those I's, it's going to run login and in on the inner loop. So we're like multiply those together or something. What, what should we be doing here? What's the what's the what's the deal? Order in login. You're, uh, it would be order in login if we did not have this part here, Megan. But we got this guy here. In squared login. So, okay, let's break this down. So, n times. So, n times it will do log in work. Then it will do n work. So these are not nested together. Like this is not a nested for loop. This is a side by side for loop. So uh, n times it's going to do login work followed by n work. And so this is going to be order n log n plus n squared. Now, which one of these is worse? Which one of these is bigger? Which one of these is going to dominate? Which term is going to dominate? Uh, when if, if if n is a million, what's bigger? n log n or n squared? n squared. So watch this. Let's order n squared. 
we don't care. The in login is insignificant. By the time you're at like a million, you're talking about the difference between like 20 million for the in login part and a trillion. Like this part here, this part here, like when n is equal to a million, this part will run 20 million times. This part will run one trillion times. So it's like, yeah, 20 million sounds like a lot, but when it's like a trillion and a trillion point oh 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 two, that point oh 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 two like literally doesn't matter. Like we literally just don't care. Anytime you have a running time that's like n squared plus n log n plus n plus seven, like we just don't care about any of these terms. Just watch this. This is what we do. What's the biggest one? What's the biggest one out of these, everyone? What's the biggest one? Maybe we have maybe we have two in here like this. Maybe we have this plus n. All right. So what is the biggest term inside of this gnarly thing that we got here? What's the biggest one? n squared, right? How many n squares do we have? Two of them. All right. So I'm going to delete everybody. And I could write 2 in, you know, squared. But guess what? Guess what? I don't care. I don't care. But it's 2 times slower. Nobody cares about being 2 times slower. Nobody cares. What matters is the difference between, like, 16 million and, like, a trillion. That's a giant difference. That's a 50 million or 50 thousand times difference in performance times two performance. We don't care when we're talking about algorithmic analysis, when we're talking about big O, all that matters is the big picture. Okay. All those smaller terms we don't care about. We delete them. If it was like, you know, five times n squared, guess what? We don't care. We, we, we don't care. We really don't because when n gets big, it's going to be far more important than the five. So we just write it like this. It's order n squared done. Okay. So your quiz for today is going to be algorithmic analysis. And this is something that you will do again and again and again. Every time you take a data structures class, every time you take a algorithm uh, algorithms class, um, you will be doing big O over and over again. And we will hammer it in this class and we will hammer it in 26. We're going to learn something called the master method to analyze recursive functions. Uh, and you'll do it again as a junior and you'll do it again as a senior and you'll do it again in grad school. It's a fun, fun part of computer science. So wait, did I say fun? No, it's not fun. It's an important part of computer science. All right. It is because being able to pick the right algorithm for the job is the difference between life and death, right? Heat death of the universe or eight seconds. Like it's a pretty big difference, right? 2000 years, eight minutes, pretty big difference. Do you pick bubble sort? Do you pick quick sort? It's a pretty big difference. You know, do you want to do you wait for the Vikings to invade again? Or do you go out for a cup of coffee? Pretty big difference. Okay. So uh, uh as a person who took junior level data structures, it is um yeah, important. Yeah. Okay, so that is it for today, guys. Thank you for coming out, uh, working on U4, ask me any questions, and we will talk about binary trees on Wednesday. Peace out. Oh, and I'm not gonna be here next Wednesday or Friday. I'm going to Toronto for a conference. See you.